welcome at this Meet the Expert session. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Walter Freumann. Walter Freumann has graduated as a medical doctor at KU Leuven in 2011. In 2019, he obtained his PhD degree in biomedical sciences with a doctoral thesis titled Progress in Differentiation and Clinical Management of Adnexal Masters. And since 2020, he was appointed associate professor at the KU Leuven. His main clinical activities and research are related to gynecological ultrasound and treatment of benign gynecology, gynecological pathology with special interest in minimal invasive and robot-assisted surgery. Welcome, Dr. Florian. Thank you, Jos, for the kind introduction and thank you to GE for the invitation to speak on this conference. I will talk about some tools that you can use inside the ultrasound machines to assess uh, adnexal masses. I will not try to repeat too many things from previous presentations, uh, but so we know that it's very important to be able to distinguish before we do any management on a patient between benign looking tumors and malignant looking tumors. Patients that have functional uh, cysts or benign tumors, they might not need any surgery at all. They might be uh, followed conservatively, while on the other hand, patients that have malignant tumors, the, the type of management will depend on the type of the, of the tumor. A borderline tumor might be treated with fertility sparing surgery. Invasive tumors might need uh, more aggressive surgery. They will, they will need more aggressive surgery, so debulking surgery and uh, systemic uh, therapy, medical therapy. And then metastatic tumors, their uh, treatment will be depending on the origin of the uh, primary tumor. So before we do any management, we want to be able to predict what type of lesion uh, the patient uh, has. And with that aim, the IOTA study has been uh, started in 1999. In several phases, thousands of patients have been recruited, already more than 30,000 in, in total. And uh, so different methods have been developed to, um, to, to, to achieve a proper diagnosis in a patient. But before we start, we know that this is the most important uh, publication of the IOTA group. It's a terms and definitions uh, paper published in, in the year 2000, uh, listing all the, all the terminology, uh, the features and the measurement methods to uh, describe an adnexal uh, tumor. And you really need to know this before you start to apply any model like the adnex model. Otherwise, you will make mistakes if you use a model without knowing the correct uh, terminology. And all of these features can be found on posters that can be used inside uh, the room where you do your ultrasound. So if we know the terminology, we can move to some diagnostic tools. So what is the best test to distinguish between benign and malignant? Subjective assessment by an experienced ultrasound operator will definitely be the best uh, test, but it's not always possible to have an, an experienced examiner available. And that's why there are several tools available to also help people that have less experience to have a good uh, diagnosis. And uh, so the risk of malignancy index is uh, existing, but it's already from 1990, and it's a little bit outdated uh, tool. So now we uh, surely um, suggest you to use the IOTA tools. There are several tools that have been published, but we will uh, focus on two most important ones. Uh, first of all, the simple descriptors, and then in the second step, the use of the uh, Altnex uh, model. So Altnex, it has been covered already in the, in the sessions uh, yesterday. It's a multi-class prediction model which can distinguish between benign and malignant, but also between several subtypes of malignant tumors. Borderline tumors, stage one invasive uh, cancer, stage two to four invasive cancer, and lastly, uh, metastasis from another uh, origin, so from the breast or the stomach, that has spread towards uh, the ovary. So as we repeat, it's very important to know this because it will guide you to the correct uh, clinical management of your patient. So up next is a mathematical uh, risk model. It's a, it's a model that you cannot use in, in your head. You have to calculate it. And it's based on uh, nine predictors. So there are three clinical predictors. It's the age of the patient, the type of center, and then you have C125, which is optional. So you don't need to have C125 to distinguish between benign and malignant. But if you have a malignant tumor, uh, the availability of C125 will help you to distinguish between, for instance, a metastasis and a primary ovarian tumor or an invasive tumor uh, compared to a borderline. And then you have six ultrasound variables which are very easy, even easier than the ones that are used in the simple rules. It's the maximal diameter of the lesion, the maximal diameter of the largest solid component. And then some questions, are there more than 10 cyst locules or not? How is the number of the populations? Do we have no populations, one, two, three, or more than three? 
are there any acoustic shadows uh, present? Do we have more than 10 uh, locules? And is there ascites present or uh, not? And again, it's not able, it's not possible to calculate this in your head. It's a logistic regression formula. It's way too complicated to have the results uh, in your head. So you have some assistance available by the calculator available on the IOTA website. There are some applications available for your smartphone. But then very importantly, you have uh, ultrasound machines that have it in the software. Uh, so there is no threshold at all anymore to um, to calculate, so when you scan your patient, you're able to calculate the risk of malignancy and the calculations of the subtypes of malignant tumors. Uh, how does Atnex work? It uh, performs very well. Uh, these are uh, a lot of validation studies, uh, external validation studies, so in populations that were not involved in the development of Atnex, so they are external validation. And we can see that most of the studies have AUCs, or areas under, under the curve, of above uh, 0.9. So it's an excellent tool to distinguish between benign and malignant. And many of these studies involve also patients with uh, and examiners with less experience, so level two examiners. So not all of these studies involve examiners that are highly experienced. When we look at IOTA phase five, it's uh, the largest published um, IOTA study so far. So on uh, more than 4,900 patients, this is the performance of the different uh, tools that we assessed. Uh, you can see that next without or with C125, it's not such a difference to distinguish between benign and malignant. So it's both excellent to uh, recognize um, a malignancy. And this is on all masses, so not uh, only patients managed uh, by surgery, but almost half of the patients uh, underwent conservative uh, follow-up. So we know that we can use these tools uh, to um, distinguish between benign and malignant on any patient, so irrespective of um, uh, the management. But then you can ask, is it really necessary to um, apply the next model to do all these calculations on every tumor? Well, the answer is, of course, uh, no, because we know that there are also the IOTA benign descriptors to sort out the very um, easy cases. So there are four benign descriptors um, uh, published that um, point you towards a specific diagnosis of uh, a common benign tumor. The first one is a unilocular tumor with ground glass echogenicity in a premenopausal patient, a lesion smaller than 10 centimeters. We all know that this is very suggestive for the presence of an endometrioma. Then on the right, the second one, benign uh, dermoid, because it's a unilocular tumor with mixed content and the presence of shadowing, also less than 10 centimeters. So everybody knows that this is suggestive for a dermoid. And then on the bottom, you have unilocular anechogenic and other types of content in unilocular uh, tumors with smooth uh, walls. So this is suggested for the presence of a serous cystadenoma or um, a mucinous cystadenoma. So we know that we don't need to use Atnex here. We can recognize these features and we can easily classify these as benign. So in many tumors, almost half of all tumors, you're able to apply these benign descriptors and you can avoid that you need to use the Atnex model. But the combination of doing first the benign descriptors and second the uh, next model is called the IOTA two-step strategy. I'm going to show you something that has not been shown on this conference uh, before, because we know only since yesterday that this paper is accepted for publication. So it's uh, the biggest validation study of the IOTA two-step strategy on IOTA 5, so almost 5,000 patients. And we can see that if you apply first the uh, benign descriptors and second the next, that we have an excellent AUC again, so to distinguish between benign and malignant. So with C125, 0.95, without C125, it's 0.94, but that's not a real difference. So if you apply first benign descriptors followed by Atnex, if you cannot use the benign descriptors, you can see that the performance is the same as the results I have shown you before uh, for patients, for all the patients where you apply Atnex. So Atnex on all the patients or first, uh, the descriptors followed by Atnex has the same performance. So you can save some time by applying the benign descriptors in the first step, and second, the Atnex model. Now we come to ORATS. It has also been shown yesterday. So we have five cl classes of uh, malignancy, and you can now use um, the, the two-step strategy, for instance, to uh, assign the patient in the correct ORATS group. And depending on the ORATS class, it can guide you uh, towards your management, conservative uh, surgery by the local gynecologist or referral to a specialized uh, gynae oncologist. And last year, this has also been suggested as the good 
pathway to use in patients where you want to um, diagnose an axial mass, so by ESGO, ESGE, ESOC and IOTA. It's a, a guideline that had been published in three journals simultaneously uh, last year. And so ultrasound using either subjective assessment by an expert or by the IOTA Altmax model is suggested here as a primary tool to uh, stratify the patient in the correct ORATS class. But after this, I think we have to go to some cases. It's a little bit interactive. We have some time left. I have prepared two cases to go together uh, with you to the ultrasound features, the description, and then we will apply the different uh, methods. So the first patient is 47 years old. She has no children, no relevant history, and she has some symptoms of abdominal uh, discomfort. I hope that the clips are a little bit clear from uh, the screen. So it's a, is it a unilocular tumor, multilocular? So we have at least one septum, so it's at least multilocular. At the start, we thought, wow, this looks like uh, some solid component, but we have to use ultrasound in a dynamic way. You will see it's a blood clot. See, it's, uh, it's like moving if you push with a probe. Um, you see that there are some very small locules. From these clips, you might think there are some solid tissue here, but if you look, um, it are very small locules packed against each other. So we could not really recognize a real solid component in this, um, in this tumor. So this was by the transabdominal view. So we see there are many locules, more than 10. We have this clot on the bottom of the cyst. So we assigned it as a multilocular tumor. We also had some shadows. I'm not sure whether you can see it from the screen. Um, they run. So behind we had a little bit of shadowing. Here behind this confluence of septa, there was some shadowing present. So multilocular shadowing, no free fluid. Then there was some blood flow. It's not really difficult to find it, but also not very abundant. We assigned it color score 3, so intermediate, but you know we don't need it to use the next model, so color score is not uh, mandatory. C125, do you think it was normal? Increased? A little bit. Exactly, it was a little bit high. Who thinks this is a benign tumor? You can raise your hand. Who thinks it's borderline? Could be. Yes, right, with a 19 centimeter yeah. Malignant, invasive malignant, nobody. Can we apply any of the benign descriptors? No, this is only applicable to unilocular tumors, so this is a multilocular tumor, we cannot use them. And then the second step is that next. So I, I show you this because it's very useful. If you scan the patient, you have the scan assist and you can use the IOTA models on the, on the machine. So you can just open it on the touchpad, you can enter all the variables, and in fact you can immediately measure the diameter of the lesion and the largest diameter of the largest solid part on the screen. So you don't lose any time, you don't have to walk to your uh, computer or you don't have to get out your smartphone to calculate it, you can just start measuring it on, on the machine. So 47 years of age, almost 20 centimeters was the lesion, no solid components, so, no, uh, so zero millimeters. We had more than 10 locules, no papillations, some shadows, no ascites. And as you know, we don't need C125 to, to calculate the risk of malignancy. So if you calculate, this is the first screen you can get. You will first look at the total risk of malignancy. So you don't have to look at the subtypes. It's not necessary. First thing we do is we look at the total risk of malignancy. In this patient, it was 3.6. And you know that we assign the diagnosis of malignancy from 10%. So this is below 10%, below the threshold. So this is not considered as a malignancy. But also you cannot say that this patient can be treated conservatively. So some people say, well, it's below 10%, then we can manage conservatively. That's not the message. So to manage conservatively, the threshold should be even lower, perhaps 1% or even lower to assign a patient to conservative management. So this is a patient that should be operated on but she can be managed uh, surgically by a general, general gynecologist. 
And then this is the column chart you can see. On the left side, these are all IOTA 3, 1, and so 1, 2, and 3 patients. And these are the risks for our patients. So we see that it's a very high risk of benign or chance of benign, a very low risk of uh, malignancy. So this patient underwent uh, laparotomy because she was sent from the oncologist to us. She was already scheduled for her surgery, so we couldn't change anymore the, the management. So they did a, a staging laparotomy with frozen section, but it was confirmed to be a benign uh, machinous cyst adenoma. Then I have a second case. She's uh, 65 years age, one child, no relevant history, no symptoms. It was an incidental finding on the, the ultrasound department. So these are the ultrasound pictures. How would you classify this tumor? Unilocular solid, solid, yeah. If you use a simple rules, be aware that you don't say it's a unilocular cyst. Many people, if they use a simple rules, they make mistakes here. If you have solid tissue, it's unilocular solid. And so, but we don't need to know this to apply the Adnex uh, model. So indeed, we have multiple populations uh, on the wall of the cysts, and they all have a size or a height that is at least three millimeters. So there are more than four populations. There are many more than four. Um, you can see that the content is not completely anechogenic. It's rather low level. Um, see the whole cyst surface at the inside is covered with uh, populations. There were no clear shadows from the populations. There are some shadows on the screen, but they are coming from the uterus or from the bowel next to the uh, cyst. But in the um, cyst itself, from the populations, we did not see any acoustic shadowing. This was a 3D reconstruction of uh, these mass. Then we look at the vascularity. We zoomed a little bit in, and you could see a little bit of vascularity in uh, the population. So they were not avascular, so there was vascularity visible, but you really had to go and search for it. So what is the color score if you have to go and search for it? Two, Two. yeah, it's minimal vascularity. So unilocular solid, it was 12 centimeters. Numerous populations, the largest measured 19 millimeters, the largest diameter. Low level content, no shadows, color score two, and no free fluid. C125 here was 18 in this patient, so it was normal. Benign, malignant, borderline malignant. <laughs> yeah, everybody raises the hand for borderline. So here, watch out, it's not unilocular, it's unilocular solid, so you cannot apply the benign uh, descriptors in this patient. Again, we can go back to the worksheet, we can fill in all the variables, and first of all, I just want to show you, you don't need to use C125 to uh, calculate the risk of malignancy, so you sh usually you don't know that value when the patient is inside your ultrasound cabin, you, you don't know the blood test yet. So we can calculate the risk of malignancy without C125 available. So the total risk of malignancy without C125, if you fill all the variables in, is for this patient 71.3. So it's a lot above the cutoff of 10%. So we are sure that we need to refer this patient to an oncologist. But you know that we want to do more. Up next can say more. Let's say that you have not seen ever a cyst like this and you're just started as a gynecologist. What can Upnext tell you? Well, in the second step, you can look at the subtypes of malignancy. So here you have the four malignant subtypes. This is our patient. This is the baseline. So this is the absolute risk for our patient. And these are the relative risks. So you can see that here the highest absolute risk is the one for borderline already a relative risk of five. So that, will, that, that means that from the baseline of all IOTA population patients, the risk of this patient is 5.5 times higher um, compared to uh, the average in the IOTA study. So you see that this risk is already pointing um, in favor of uh, a borderline uh, tumor. What happens if you add C125, just to show you, the relative risk is going from 5.5, if you add C125 to 6.4. So C125 helps in this model to show that it has the most chance to be a borderline tumor. And the same will account if you have a patient with a metastasis, then it will show towards metastasis or to a stage one invasive. So the addition of C125 will make it more clearly in what direction you have to think if you want to manage your patient. 
And here we can see again the column uh, charts on the machine. So on the left side, these are all the IOTA 123 patients. On the right side, we have our patients. The yellow bar is the risk of borderline, and that's the bar that has increased uh, most, as you can see um, in our patients. So relative risk of 6.4. And indeed, this patient underwent surgery by the oncologists again, and it was confirmed to be a borderline serious uh, cystadenoma. I will conclude already here uh, with telling you that, first of all, before you start to do any assessment of an axial masses, you have to know the standardized terminology. I've seen many patients and course, uh, many people in courses that were using the wrong terminology and then they use the up next differently and then you have wrong results. Then you have different risk calculations and what you should obtain. So start with the terminology and how you need to measure the, the, the features before you start to use any model. Otherwise you will get in trouble. And then the two-step strategy. So again, published since yesterday or accepted for publication since uh, yesterday. So first of all, we can classify many patients by using the benign easy descriptors, benign simple descriptors. And if they are not applicable, in the second step, you can use Atmix. And if you add C125, you can really know very well what type of malignancy uh, the patient has. And if you use this two-step strategy, it's one of the options you have to use also ORATS. So that is a connection from the risk stratification to the clinical management of uh, the patient. And the last thing I think is very important for clinicians that are very busy in clinical practice. Um, it's difficult because if you scan patients and it's not so professional to say, well, now I will run to my desk and open the application on, my, on the website. I will start to calculate or I will get out my smartphone. So it's not so, not so professional towards the patient. So it's easy now. You have the software available on the spot when you scan the patient in the machine. And it's very easy to calculate the risk uh, while you're scanning the patient. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. Um, that was excellent. Um, do you ever, because you're an expert, um, so you in your head, you don't need Adnex. Do you ever use Adnex and then say, I don't agree? Does that happen to you ever? Um, I have to, admi I have to admit, agree? sometimes it happens. So sometimes I check if there's a particular case I, that I'm very curious to know what Adnex will tell. Um, and who, who tends yeah. to be correct, you or Adnex? I'm just curious. Well, if, if there's a discrepancy, I, I try to go for the for the worst case scenario. Um, so, but um, yeah, it happens sometimes that you that at Nexus it's a advanced stage of ovarian cancer, and you think, well, it seems more to be a metastasis. Or so sometimes it happens. Um, but um, I think in general, but you need to see a lot of uh, of masses uh, like like you in clinical practice to to be confident in knowing what type of tumor you're dealing with. And I think for, for, for people that have not uh, the chance to see so many anexal tumors, it's a real improvement. Um, because there, I mean, if you just calculate, Adnex has been developed on almost 6,000 patients. Well, before you see 6,000 patients in your life, um, of which 40% are malignant, you have to do a long career to have the same experience as Adnex. So people that just started as a gynecologist, uh, they have not a chance to have this kind of experience. So, but. Indeed, if you see many uh, malignancies and you start to feel how they look like or to see how they look like, it might be um, the subjective assessment might be an addition to, to what Adnex is saying. And sometimes it might influence a little bit uh, the management, yeah. Fair question. Actually, what you have seen, actually, there was an E10 system, but there was also an S10 system, for example. So we have this implemented in our in our series, actually, which are available now. Um, just we know that there's actually common practice with various systems, so it's it's available on our Boson system range. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>